Good afternoon. I'm Katie Hogan, like they said, and I'm here to talk to you about my two favorite things, and that's funny and money. I've discovered that by combining my love for all things funny, I'm more effectively able to teach people about money. If there's one lesson that I want you to take away from today, it's that financial literacy is not rocket science, but it is crucial, and in fact, it can be kind of fun. And I know this because I am both a comedy writer and a financial planner. And I am fully aware of how strange a combination this is. I also know that this makes me a huge nerd in several social circles. By day, I use the left side of my brain to create plans to help millennials better manage their money. And at night, I switch to the right side of my brain to pen jokes and sketches that mortify my grandmothers. It is quite the professional quandary. Or so I thought. Let's go back to 2011. I had just finished my master's degree, and I was moving back in with my parents and unemployed. Yay. Uh, um, and one evening, I was sitting on their couch wearing gray sweatpants from head to toe and crying hysterically as I saw the balance of my student loans for the very first time. It was in this moment that I realized I had lived my whole life completely ignorant about money, and it was now about to bite me in my sweatpant clad behind. Even though I was an avid reader and considered myself a student of life, whatever that means, I was completely financially illiterate. And as I stared at my laptop showing me my six-figure student loan debt, I cried ugly tears and snot began, began to run from my face down onto my college sweatshirt, which I now understood it cost nearly a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> In this moment, I was lost, I was angry and ashamed, but amid one of the darkest periods of my life, I made a promise to myself that I would find a way out of this hole that I dug myself into and uh, find a way out of it and do better. So I became uh, obsessed with reading all things personal finance and self-development. And eventually, I was offered a job down in Boston, and while it wasn't in a field I'd studied, it did get me out of my parents' house, and you've never seen two parents pack up boxes so quickly. <laughs> As it <laughs> turns out, I'm not a great roommate. At my new job, during my lunch hours, I'd walk across the street to the Boston Public Library where I would check out books on money and investing, and while I found most of the material was painfully boring, I found I really loved learning about personal finance. I also found that, uh, or I realized that this stuff should have been taught in school, and that if a somewhat intelligent person like myself didn't know anything about money, chances are neither did my friends, or my classmates, or my generation as a whole. So I decided to pursue finance as a career, and this is shocking coming from someone who attended the most liberal of the liberal arts colleges. I literally once took a class called listening to music. <laughs> and I, soon I was working as a traditional financial advisor, and while I love the knowledge and training I was getting every day at this massive company, I found myself being forced to service older millionaire clients who really didn't like taking advice from a 27-year-old with less than a year of experience. And I can't say that I blame them. I knew in my heart who I wanted to help, and it was young people like me. It was people who were carriers of hefty student loan debt and who maybe preferred sweatpants to power suits. I wanted to help people who were working their butts off but needed a roadmap to find a way out of living paycheck to paycheck. So the next year, with two whole years of experience under my belt, I took a huge risk, and I launched my own financial planning firm. And this idea was about as well received as the time I told everyone I wanted to be a storm chaser like Helen Hunt and Twister. <laughs> so business was extremely slow when I first launched. My goal was to help millennials become more financially literate, but my messaging, it sounded exactly like every other money guru out there. Every day I asked, how do you get young adults to want to learn about retirement accounts? How do you get them to pay attention to the terms of their credit cards? How do you get them to care? 
They need this information, Rudy. And Rudy is my golden retriever who never offers any helpful advice. <laughs> Coincidentally, it was during this time that I decided to pursue comedy as both a hobby and a coping mechanism to keep me from going crazy. I had just launched a business I had no business launching. I was living a thousand miles away from my family and friends and I craved a creative outlet. I found I had a knack for writing funny and soon I was writing for the stage and short films. I got stuff onto Funny or Die, McSweeney's and several others. I absolutely fell in love with comedy. And then one day, I was sitting at my computer working on a financial plan and wondering how long it was going to be before I went out of business and was forced to return to a diet of ramen noodles and Hot Pockets that a thought popped into my head. Why don't I try to teach people about financial literacy using comedy? Is that even possible? And then if by divine intervention, I read a quote from former First Lady Michelle Obama, and she said, first you get them to laugh, then you get them to listen. And this was like a field of dreams moment for me, except it was Mrs. Obama whispering into my ear, if you're funny, they will learn. If you're funny, they will learn. It became clear to me, financial literacy was my mission and humor is gonna be my vessel. So at this point, you're probably asking yourself, why am I so hell-bent on promoting financial literacy? Why can't I just be a regular financial planner who sits in a cubicle and wears clothes from Ann Taylor Loft? Well, as, <laughs> which is ironic because I'm wearing Ann Taylor Loft. As I said, this was a deeply personal journey. And the more I spoke to my peers, the more I understood I was not alone in my money woes and that this is very much a ubiquitous problem. Here are a few stats that aren't funny at all, but they are the driving force behind my mission to promote financial literacy. Two thirds of Americans cannot pass a basic financial literacy test. While the numbers in general are bad, the statistics among women are even worse. Nearly 75% of women cannot pass that same test. Financial illiteracy in America has reached epidemic proportions. Half of all Americans have absolutely nothing saved for retirement. And most Americans, they don't know what they'd do if a $400 unexpected expense came about. This is terrifying, and it saddens me to know hard-working people are burdened and overwhelmed. Our collective student loan debt has surpassed $1.2 trillion. Our consumer debt stands at more than a trillion. In the words of Tom Hanks in Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. Without a financial education, you are more likely to go into debt, we're more likely to fall victim to predatory lenders, financial scams, and make costly mistakes with our money. Without a financial education, we're more likely to have poor credit and file for bankruptcy, which can prevent us from making large purchases, such as cars and homes, and may even lead to discrimination when applying for jobs in the future. Without a financial education, we are not prepared to maximize our employer benefits or negotiate for higher pay. We're more likely to live in poverty, and we're more likely to see this cycle continue for generation after generation after generation. It is estimated that by eradicating financial illiteracy, we would close the wealth inequality gap by one third. That is not an insignificant number. To solve many of our socioeconomic inequalities, financial literacy needs to be a focal point. And while there are systemic and institutionalized forms of financial oppression, promoting financial literacy is a terrific place to start in fixing these larger societal problems. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that I am an unapologetic feminist, and, and in my very opinionated opinion, I believe financial literacy among women and marginalized groups will create a ripple effect. Change won't happen overnight, but as we educate women and girls on financial matters, we will empower them. 
This will hopefully lead to more women in influential positions where they can then affect real change. And only then are we going to see a society that truly reflects our values. This isn't going to be easy. But again, we can start by providing women and girls the education they're going to need to take over the world. And you should know, as I said that last line, me and Beyonce, we were laughing maniacally in our heads. There are so many individual and societal benefits tied to a more financially educated population. Unfortunately, money is power. So we must arm ourselves with the necessary financial knowledge to more effectively fight for what is right. Not to mention, you'll just be better at spending and saving, investing, and so much more. Okay, I know I just went on like this passionate rant and you're probably like, well, she's a bit more angry than she is funny. So let's take a look. <laughs> it's true. Uh, let's take a look at why I'm integrating comedy with my passion for personal finance. I started to look into the benefits of using humor as a teaching tool. And as it turns out, there's quite a bit of empirical evidence in favor of its efficacy in an educational setting. Quick confession, I don't even know what efficacy means. Uh, but, you know, this is a TEDx event and I wanted to sound smart. I want to sound smart, so. Anyways, I continued my research into humor's efficacy. Still don't know if I'm using that correctly. And I found a Pew Research poll discovered that viewers of The Daily Show and The Colbert Report exhibited higher retention of news facts compared to those who only got their news from mainstream networks and newspapers. Well, what do these shows have in common? They use humor to explain and break down complex and tedious topics. You can do the same thing with other important subjects as well. Other research in neuroscience and cognitive studies show that humor activates our brain's dopamine reward system and that this release of dopamine is important for long-term learning or, or long-term memory and learning. When humor is used correctly, it can improve retention. Lastly, humor helps cultivate a sense of community, and I think that's important regarding matters of personal finance. I want people to know that they aren't alone in their financial struggles and that it is okay to talk about it and ask for help because millennials, we are all on this Sally Mae Titanic together. So I decided to do what no financial professional has done before, and that is try to make people laugh. Uh, so I, I wrote a book as if I was half Amy, Sh Amy Schumer and half Susie Orman. I also launched a, bl a blog and a podcast where I use the same technique of infusing humor into my lessons. And guess what? It's actually working. I don't have a huge audience, but those who are tuning in are hungry for this knowledge. But they want it presented in a way that is entertaining, easy to digest, and isn't condescending. My mission in using humor to spread financial literacy is simple. I hope I can inspire all of you to continue your own financial education. Learning to be proficient in matters of money, it doesn't have to be boring or difficult. It's not rocket science. But it is imperative we learn the fundamentals. You don't have to know how to trade options or explain derivatives either. It's a lot more basic than that. So the next time you're teaching your kids how to be responsible with an allowance or explaining to teens the pros and cons of a credit card. Don't be afraid to throw in a joke or two. You may not always land the punchline, but I promise you the lesson will stick and they will be better for it. Because learning how to be an adult, it doesn't have to be so serious. Thank you.